good evening everyone i welcome you all to the student research seminar series 2022 starting i'll like to give a brief or bio of uh, mr nagabhushan nagabhushan obtained his be in electronics and communication from pes institute of technology in 2016 he then worked as a software engineer in cisco systems india private limited for two years He joined IIC in 2018 and is currently pursuing PhD at the Visual Information Processing Lab at ECE Department with Dr. Rajiv Sundaraji. He is a recipient of Prime Minister Research Fellowship. His current interests include image and video signal processing, machine learning, and computer computer vision. So now I request Nagabhushan to start his presentation. Thank I'll you. unshare. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, it's visible. Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, so today I'll be presenting my work on temporal view synthesis for dynamic scenes. So. first let's see what is temporal view synthesis now consider let's say you are uh, exploring some virtual environment in a head mounted camera or a vr headset that is becoming increasingly popular now say or maybe you are playing some game in the vr headset the way it happens is a virtual environment is loaded in the headset and uh, as and when you move in that virtual environment the image that is displayed on the headset gets updated at uh, at a high frame rate it's usually 30 fps or 45 or 90 fps that is 90 frames per second so um suppose uh, let's say you tilt your head at that time what happens uh, the scene has to get updated so that uh, if you are looking at the right the right part of the scene should become visible now if you have a low compute device which is not able to render the videos at very high frame rate what happens is that there will be a lag in the video that you see that is you tilt your head slightly to the right but the video doesn't get updated instantaneously and it, it get there's some lag in the when the video gets updated this can lead to some artifacts called as shader or other artifacts basically it causes discomfort for the user so there are uh, some ways like um VR headset manufacturers like Oculus and Valve have come up with uh, a technique called as asynchronous reprojection or motion smoothing. In that, what they do is that uh, if the graphic renderer is not able to render the frame in the at the required time, they use the previous frame and they project the previous uh, all the pixels from the previous frame into the 3D scene and then reproject it back onto the top from the onto the target view. they use uh, it can be done using simple computer vision techniques using 3d geometry and uh, mainly 3d geometry but what there are some challenges associated with this so in this work we uh, we propose a learning based solution for the same problem to get a better uh, output unfortunately because they are uh, commercial and closed uh, um, softwares will not be able to compare with them but still uh, we'll compare with existing uh, other open source uh, techniques so to describe the problem technically the goal is that if you are given certain past frames of a video along with the camera poses let's say we know the frames n n minus 2 n minus 4 and so on along with their uh, camera poses at that instance and the camera pose of the next frame let's say n plus 1 we ask the question if we can the, uh, generate the next frame n plus 1 without having to actually uh, or graphically render that frame what will be its, how can we use it in this context so when uh, if we have a low compute device what we can do is we can ask the graphic renderer to render at a lower frame rate say if you want at 30 fps we can ask it to render at 15 fps so that it gets more time to render the frame and intermediate we can use our uh, prediction engine to predict the next frames note that this is a causal constraint that is uh, when we are predicting frame n plus 1 we can use only previous frames n n minus 2 and so on we can't use the frame n plus 2 that's why this is kind of a prediction problem and not an interpolation problem 
So in this work, we'll consider frame rate doubling. Uh, that is, uh, every alternate frame is uh, generated, rendered by the graphics renderer, and we predict the next uh, every alternate frame again. So one can study the temporal view synthesis in two contexts. One is when the scene is static, and the other is scene is dynamic. That is, uh, in a static scene, all the objects in the scene will be stationary. An example can be like maybe you are trying to purchase a house that is far away and you, let's say you don't want to go uh, to that place you just want to explore the house on a head mounted camera sitting at your current uh, place of residence in such cases there won't be any moving objects in the scene and hence the only person that will be moving is the user or the camera but if we look at games and other stuff in that case the objects in the scene can also be moving as seen in the second video so the first uh, in the static scene, it was uh, we studied it uh, before, and my colleague Vijayalakshmi had presented in the seminar series. So this work is an extension of that, where we consider dynamic scenes. So the challenge in the static scene, the challenge is mainly disaffusions. That is, uh, if you look at the top video, as the camera moves towards the left, some part of the uh, carpet which was previously hidden or occluded now becomes visible. So when we want to predict the next frame will have to generate the content in those uh, regions. Such uh, regions which were hidden in the previous frame and become visible in the next frame, we call them as disocclusions. So in static scene, the main challenge is disocclusions or infilling the disocclusions. Whereas when we come to dynamic scenes, there are objects moving as well. Now, even though we know the camera pose of the user, the way, where the user is looking at, we don't know how the objects are moving or the position and the orientation of the objects. So we have to predict the object motion. And uh, so here, disocclusions can be caused by two things. Either it's because of moving camera as well as moving objects. Like in the video, second video here, as the chair moves towards the left, some part of the drawer behind the chair, which was previously occluded, now becomes visible. So these are the main two challenges uh, in dynamic scenes. So given this context, let's look at some popular work in the related uh, area. So one um, very close topic is uh, novel view synthesis. So in novel view synthesis, the goal is that given a few one or multiple images and their corresponding uh, camera pose, we want to see how the scene looks like from a novel viewpoint, that is with the target the camera viewpoint. Typically, novel view synthesis methods do not uh, assume that depth is known. So the main goal here is uh, estimating the depth of the scene. There have been uh, novel view synthesis has been a classic problem in computer vision, but with the advent of deep learning, uh, it has found much more. Uh, people have started working much more in this context. Uh, if we want to to broadly classify the different works in novel view synthesis over the past uh, five, six years. We can classify them as three into three types. The first one is called as image-based rendering. That is, uh, here, they were, given the input source views, the target view is con uh, constructed by just copying some information from the image directly. So in one, uh, one of the popular papers called as appearance flow, they try to predict uh, flow vectors. That is for every pixel in the target view, they try to see where it can, where it came from in the source view. And then they just read off the information from such locations. But then later came uh, 3D representations or volumetric representations, where the idea is to represent the scene as a 3D in, using some 3D representation. And then when we want to see the scene in a novel view, we just have to render from the 3D scene. So one popular paper here is called as a multi-plane image by Zhou et al. So they represent the scene as multiple planes. So this is similar to like in Photoshop, we see different layers of images, right? It's similar, the same, the idea is very similar to that, but the different planes are placed at different depths. So in the scene, if there are two objects, let's say one at uh, closer depth and the other one behind it at a um, larger depth, this can the scene can be represented with two planes. The first plane at the closer depth represents uh, contains the information about foreground object. 
and the second plane contains information about the background object. But then uh, so this has for these uh, kinds of representations have found uh, good uh, success in this domain. And then in 2020, a phenomenal paper came called as Neural Radiance Fields. So it represents the 3D scene as a neural network. That is for at a point x comma y. If I want to ask what is the, if I want to know what the color uh, intensity is, the network predicts the intensity in 3D for a given point. However, although these uh, all these models have found tremendous success in view synthesis, the one main limitation is that they do not account for object motions. They assume that the scene is static. And also. Uh, because we are considering virtual reality scenarios, the scene is a synthetic scene, and we can assume that the depth map is known. But uh, these methods do not make use of depth map, which, uh, as a result, the if if they make use of depth map, they can do much better. Uh, they can perform much better. So uh, coming to that, there is another field called as depth image-based rendering, where they uh, it's an image-based rendering technique, but uses the depth map. So using uh, 3D geometry, they warp the source view to the target view using uh, the computer vision tools such as platting and uh, there are some tools to do that. And as a result, this can lead to disocclusions when we work using the depth and 3D geometry. They use simple image in painting algorithms to infill such holes. But again, the drawback of these methods is they do not uh, model the object motion. Then recently, so dynamic view synthesis has gained traction. Here, the, the, the authors try to model a dynamic scene using either an MPI representation or a neural radiance field or nerve representation. Typically, these uh, methods, they do not predict object motion. That is, uh, you have a monocular video where the scene is dynamic. Uh, at, at a certain time instant, the scene is known from a given viewpoint. The goal here is to predict the scene from a different viewpoint at the same time instant. And I think the one uh, recent work, they try to interpolate between the times. So there is kind of a object motion interpolation, but they do not do prediction, which is the goal in uh, temporal view synthesis. So finally, another related uh, area is a video prediction. Our problem statement resembles very close to that of video prediction. In video prediction, the goal is that uh, if you are given a few past frames of a video, the goal is to predict a future frame. So again, video prediction was a classical problem and it was uh, very it was used mostly in uh, video compression. But recently, again, with uh, deep learning, uh, much richer methods have come out. So I uh, just mentioned uh, three different works here. One is the one is called as a MCNet or a motion content network. This is one of the robust video prediction models. Here, the idea is to decompose a video into motion and content. So if you look at a video, the content of the video doesn't change much, but it's there is usually motion in the video. So what they do, they represent the entire video with a single content latent vector, but uh, they represent every frame with a motion latent vector. To predict future frames, they predict the motion vectors or motion vectors in the latent space, and then they merge the content vector with the predicted motion vectors to generate the future frames. Another popular work is called as disentangling propagation and generation. So this is an optical flow based work, which is very close to our idea. So here, what they do is for a given when suppose we are trying to predict a frame n plus one. For every pixel in n plus one, they try to see where it can be read off in frame n. So, and then when we construct frame n plus one this way, there can be some ghosting artifacts. That is, some objects can get repeated. They have a mechanism to detect such artifacts, and then they will remove those artifacts and use a simple infilling network to infill those holes. There is another uh, subbranch of video prediction called stochastic prediction. Here, this is mainly used when we are predicting long term into the future. That is, if you are predicting five or six seconds into the future, uh, usually future is uh, uncertain. We don't know exactly what can happen. So they model this uh, uncertainty using uh, a stochastic random variable and try to predict multiple futures for the given past. 
But in our context, since we, we are just predicting one frame that is like one by 30th of a second or one by 30th of a second. And also we want just one frame. We don't want multiple plausible futures. We don't uh, consider stochastic prediction in this problem. But what is the problem of video prediction models? They do not uh, utilize the availability of camera pose and depth, which is available in temporal view synthesis. Okay. So given this uh, related work, uh, given the context, uh, the counter, our contributions are as follows. We propose a novel model called decomponent, uh, which decomposes the motion into camera motion and object motion and thereby predicts the next frame. We do the object motion prediction by isolating object motion in past frames. Because if we look at the past frames, they contain both uh, camera motion and object motion. We first isolate the object motion and then predict for the future motion. And we also propose a model for uh, infilling the disocclusions. And due to lack of databases uh, for this problem, we also develop a new large scale database to evaluate different uh, temporal view synthesis models. Any questions? Okay, uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to stop me and ask. Uh, and we'll go to the next uh, part. So before going into the algorithmic details, I would like to visually illustrate the idea behind our model. Let's say this is our frame n and we want to predict the next frame n plus one. So this is frame n. When we go to next frame n plus one here, the camera is moving towards the right and the cylinder or the cylinder kind of object on the bed is moving slightly to the right. And also the lamp that is beside the bed is coming towards the front. Let me just toggle it a couple of times. This is frame n and this is frame n plus one, n and the n plus one. So the idea is this, uh, if you want to predict, uh, if you want to use, utilize the available camera motion, we just want to predict the object motion. So given the frame n plus one, we only predict object motion that where an object would move in the next time instant. Like for example, like this. So as you can see here, the we have seen camera hasn't moved, but only moving objects have moved to the next time instant. That is the cylinder has moved to the right and the lamp has come slightly to the front. After this, then we apply the camera motion. That is the camera moves to the right. And this is how the scene would look like. Now, as you can see, whenever uh, an object, uh, either object moves or camera moves, some part of the scene which was not visible earlier, like for example, here, the some part of the pillow, that is represented as black because it is now visible, but we don't know uh, what the intensity is there. So here we need a disocclusion infilling model to infill all these holes so that we get our final next frame n plus one. So this is our uh, block diagram or overview of our algorithm. Given uh, past frames, we use a local motion prediction uh, module where we predict the object motion. Object motion is also referred as local motion because the motion is localized to the object. Whereas camera, when the camera moves, the entire, all the pixels in the image move and hence we refer to it as global motion. So here uh, we first predict the object motion and we model the object motion in terms of optical flow. That is for every pixel in frame n, we, we try to predict where that pixel would have moved at time instant n plus one in the view of frame n. That is, uh, we represented it by w hat l here. Once we predict the object motion, then we account for the camera motion using the depth and camera pose and uh, um, 3D geometry. We compute where each pixel would move in the next uh, frame due to camera motion. So when we combine these two motions, object motion, camera motion, we get the total uh, motion or the total optical flow, which describes for every pixel in frame n where it would have moved in frame n plus one due to both object and camera motion. Then we employ motion warping uh, as shown in the equation below. So what this represents is that suppose uh, we look at a pixel X and uh, due to object motion, the optical flow we predicted is W hat L. So due to object motion, the 
pixel at x would have moved to x plus wl. Then due to camera motion, where it would have moved is given by pn to n plus 1, that operator. So that gives us where it would have moved in the next frame. So what we do is that at that next position that we have predicted, we populate the intensity there in frame n plus 1 by copying the intensity from frame n at the position x. Once we obtain this motion warp frame, now there are only holes in that and we need a disocclusion infilling model. Uh, instead of using a, some generic uh, image or video in painting model, we design a new module which exploits the motion that caused the disocclusions to obtain a better infilling. So in the next slides, I'll give a brief uh, explanation of each of the submodules. So first let's look at how we predict the object motion. For the uh, moment, just ignore this uh, bottom part of the block diagram. So the first uh, part in motion prediction is we estimate the motion uh, object motion in the past frames. Now, since we are considering very high frame rates like 30 FPS or higher, we assume that the motion is almost linear at such high frame rates. That is, uh, if an object, um, the motion between frames n and n minus two is similar to the motion between n and n plus one. So because of this assumption, we use only two past frames to predict the future frame. So we first estimate object motion from n to n minus 2. And then uh, we just extrapolate it to get the motion from n to n plus 1. For example, consider an, um, an object that is at position some, let's say, 5. And in the n minus 2, let's say it was at 3. So from n minus 2 to n, it has moved from uh, unit 3 to unit 5. So if we extrapolate it linearly, we would expect it to move to 6, right? So that is the optical flow from n to n minus 2 is uh, 2, and we want the optical flow from n to n plus 1 is plus 1. So to predict that, we just uh, divide the optical flow by 2 and reverse the direction because n to n minus 2 is the direction is different from n to n plus 1. And that gives us the object motion from n to frame n to frame n plus 1. We use a popular uh, PwC net based architecture for optical flow estimation. And we make some changes in that uh, architecture so that it's suitable for our purpose. But uh, we, the f critical step here is predicting the object motion from frame n to n minus 2. Now, when we look at the frames n and n minus 2, they contain both object motion as well as uh, camera motion. Suppose let's say this is frame n and this is our frame n minus 2. As you can see, the objects are also moving and camera is also moving. So uh, predict, estimating the object motion alone in this becomes challenging. So what we do is we isolate the object motion between these two frames because we exactly know the camera motion between these two frames. In other words, we warp the frame n minus 2 to the view of frame n. That is, uh, this is our frame n. And the warp, oh, sorry, yeah, this is our frame n, and this is the frame n minus 2 warp to the view of n. As you can see, between these two frames, there is no camera motion. And the only motion that we observe between these two frames is the object motion. As a result, now it becomes much easier to predict the motion between these two frames. And the optical flow here represents the optical flow for these objects. However, there's a challenge here. As you can see in this uh, warp frame, there are disocclusions or black regions. Now, if you use an off-the-shelf optical flow estimation uh, algorithm, it might uh, it might not work as expected because of the presence of these black regions. So, uh, to handle this, we introduce what we what is called as partial convolutions. So, in the optical flow estimation network, we replace all the convolutional layers with partial convolutions. So what is partial convolution? Um, in normal convolution layer, if you have an input feature X, capital X, you convolve with it with a weight W and then add uh, a bias term B. In partial convolution, it takes a mask along with the input feature or image and com com computes the convolved output and also outputs a mask. And the way the output is computed is as follows. It first uh, masks out all the invalid pixels in the input image or feature by multiplying it with a mask. 
and then you converse with the weight, weights and biases, uh, converse with weights and adds the bias. So because some of the pixels in the, the window that is taken for convolution might be invalid, the output is scaled accordingly using this sum of one by sum of m. And similarly, the mask is updated such that if the in the window, if there is at least one valid pixel, then the mask is set to one, otherwise it's set to zero so that it propagates to the next level. So this way, uh, what happens is that what wherever there are black regions, they won't affect uh, the features computed in the convolutional network at all. So the when the features optical flow estimation network, when it computes the features from the images, it ignores all these black regions. And that's uh, in that way, it's able to match the two images properly without or handle the without uh, getting uh, affected by the presence of these holes. We also make another slight uh, modification in the flow network because we are considering synthetic scenes. Our uh, depth map is already available to us, and at some places where the intensity-based matching is ambiguous, the depth map can help, and hence we also input uh, depth map to the optical flow estimation network. So using this, we predict the optical flow from frame n to n minus two, then extrapolate it to get the optical flow from n to n plus one then add the camera motion and do the motion warping to obtain the motion warp frame in n plus one. Now this frame has a uh, disocclusion. So we need a disocclusion infilling model to infill the disocclusions. Here we make an observation that uh, we can infill all these holes by copying intensities from its neighbors. Although this idea of copying intensities exists, it's usually used to copy intensities from matching pixels. That is, uh, if a pixel is not visible in frame n plus one, but is visible in n, the intensity is copied from n to n plus one using a flow vector. But here we use it to infill disocclusions. And by definition, the pixel disoccluded pixels are not visible in previous frames. So instead, we predict a pseudo flow vectors to the previous frame uh, from where we can read off intensities to predict our, uh, to infill the uh, disocclusions. So here we make use of the motion that actually caused these disocclusions. Like for example, consider an object moving to the right. So when an object moves to the right, what was behind that object now becomes visible to us. Now, if you want to infill this region, whatever the disocclusion, disocclusion region that is visible now, to which object will it belong to? To the region to its left or to its right? It will always belong to the region to its left because on the right, it's the foreground object that is moving. Thus, the object which the disoccluded region belongs to it has a high correlation with the direction of the motion. So we exploit this uh, idea in our disocclusion infilling model. We use the overall uh, optical flow that is predicted and use a flow reversal layer to predict optical flow from frame n plus one to n in the known regions, that is except the disoccluded regions. And then we use a simple unit based architecture to predict pseudo flow vectors in for every of these disaccluded pixels. And using the flow vectors, we just read off intensities from previous frame Fn to infill the disocclusions in n plus one. Okay, uh, so that concludes the algorithmic part of my talk. And then uh, when we because we want to evaluate these temporal view synthesis models. There are, there are no large scale databases uh, to do a thorough evaluation. And because of this, we develop our own database. So we use Blender to generate videos. Uh, we select, uh, we use blend files available on uh, BlendSwap and other websites and add camera motion as well as object motion to the scenes. So this uh, database is an extension of the database we used in the static scene, uh, static scene case. But there it had only object motion. Here we also add the, sorry, uh, there it had only camera motion. Here we also add the object motion. We have 200 unique scenes in our database and four, vi uh, four videos per scene from different viewpoints. So totally we have 800 videos in our database at full HD resolution. To compare uh, as a benchmark, we compare our model with uh, video prediction models such as MCNet and uh, DPG. 
but uh, because these video prediction models do not make use of the depth and the camera motion it is slightly unfair to directly compare with them so instead what we also do is we combine a view synthesis model along with a view prediction model so a view synthesis model takes care of the camera motion and then the video prediction model has to predict only the object motion for view synthesis we use a model called as sinsin that also is also based on uh, the 3d geometry based warping like ours but they do the warping in a feature space so we first apply sinsin on all the past frames to bring all the past frames to the view of frame n plus 1 and then apply mcnet or uh, dpg on these frames to predict the final frame n plus 1 for uh, uh, evaluation we evaluate all these models on our data set where we divide the 200 scenes into 135 train scenes and 65 test scenes we also compare these models on uh, mpi central database this is a very small database consisting of 23 scenes where we use 13 scenes for training and test 10 scenes for testing and uh, for evaluation metrics we use the popularly used uh, PSNR and structural structural similarity measures, But, uh, because these measures they can only compare at a frame level. That is, they compare the predicted frame and the, its corresponding ground truth frame. They do not evaluate the temporal quality of the video. So to also evaluate the temporal quality of the video, we use a uh, ST rate metric, which uh, computes both the spatial and temporal quality. So here. Um, We see a few the quantitative evaluation of our models. As you can see, uh, for this metric uh, PSNR and SIM, the higher the value, it, the better it is. And for estimate, the lower the value, the better it is. As we can see, our model is able to outperform all the existing models in terms of all the three metrics. And to look at few qualitative comparisons, um, say in the first one, as you can see the chair is moving slightly to the right as you can see the legs have moved to the right and uh, you can see the other models like dpg has distorted the shape of the leg and sinsin has sinsin plus mcnet has brought in some new artifacts whereas our model is able to predict the next frame considerably uh, reasonably well while other models they fail to retain the texture in the scenes we, our model is able to retain the texture as well there is a video comparison probably i'll show it uh, after the the end of the presentation so just want to show one ablation uh, for model the, that is the use of depth in optical flow estimation uh, on the right side is the frame predicted without using depth in optical flow estimation as you can see the cart has been distorted the heavily this is because the intensity based matching between two frames here becomes difficult because of uh, repeated patterns and the same intensity but in such cases having depth also as information can help the flow estimation model to predict optical flow in more robust manner and as you can see the cart the shape of the cart has been preserved when we use depth in the flow estimation <coughs> sorry this is one of the failure cases of our model so this so we have observed quite a few times and this has been observed in other video prediction models as well so if whenever a foreground object is moving and the background is static we sometimes observe that the when the optical flow is estimated the background also moves slightly along with the foreground object in this example the frame on the foreground is moving to the right whereas the background the cot and pillows are static but in the predicted optical flow it has predicted a motion for the cot here which is also in green color as a result we see some distortions in in such kind of cases so uh, anyway to conclude uh, my presentation we developed a framework uh, for upsampling the frame rate of videos by decoupling the camera motion and object motion we predict the object motion by isolating the object motion between the past frames and we also presented a seclusion infilling module we designed a challenging database to evaluate uh, the temporal view synthesis models and we show that uh, 
our model achieves state of the art performance so in future we are planning to extend our framework to real world videos where the one of the main challenge is the unavailability of the ground truth depth so recently neural radiance fields have shown really good performance for view synthesis so we are planning to see how we can uh, extend the, or make use of this neural radiance fields for uh, temporal view synthesis of dynamic scenes uh, yeah i think that's the end of the presentation let me just uh, play out the video let me share the screen again Can you see my screen? Yes. This is just a sample video. It's of five seconds in length. The left side is uh, the DPG model, and the middle one is our model, and on the right side is the ground truth. As you can see around these regions, the temporal quality of the DPG model is not. Uh, so good it has some flickering artifacts whereas uh, our model is more temporally smooth and uh, if you are wondering what this car is yes it's a bad movie okay yeah that concludes my talk thank you everyone if you have any questions i'll be happy to take Yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, the bad mobile was already there in uh, one of the blend scenes. I just imported it into this scene. So, do you also try to make your own database, like adding to it? Yes. So, the, we had the from the previous work, we had database where there was camera motion. So, if there were some objects in the scene, we added motion or animation to the such objects. And in some scenes where there are no moving objects, we add new objects uh, and add uh, motion to those objects. Did that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Any uh, other questions? Thank you. That was really an engaging talk. Uh, so now just a small token of thanks from IEEE ISC Communication Society chapter. So this is our virtual plaque to you uh, for your talk. Thank you so yeah. much for taking the time and uh, delivering this uh, talk. Yeah. Thank you for the plaque. Yeah. Yeah. We look forward to see you in other events as well. Yeah. Thank you, sir.